From the distance of space, evidence of man's passage and the dramas that enliven the Earth are imperceptible. Here and there on this blue sphere, man's footsteps have left light and fleeting impressions. In the heart of the Rockies, in a place called Yellowstone, the idea that there should always be wild places began. The first white man to see the Yellowstone region was probably John Coulter, who left the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1807 to explore the West on his own. The mountain men found the West rich in wildlife. That is what had drawn the mountain men here. They'd come in search of beaver to supply the fur trade in Europe. Only a relatively small number of mountain men would see this Yellowstone region, however. Located in a remote corner of what is now Wyoming, it's surrounded by mountains and covered by snow for much of the year. So while the exploration and settlement of the American West was going on all around it, Yellowstone itself remained an unknown, mysterious region over two million acres. By the middle of the last century, the mountain men felt that the wilderness was vanishing. And they were sorry to see the settlers moving in. Oh, Zachariah. Good to see you, Judd. Good to see you haven't lost your hair. Yeah. Saw a wagon down this year's rendezvous. Yeah, this is going to be my last one. Well, it's changing. But we didn't we see the best of it. Yeah, then we're shining times. Yeah, these mountains are getting too tame for me. Too many dang fool pilgrims. Some of these mountain men became famous. Men like Joe Meek and Jim Bridger. And the mountain men tried to tell others about the natural wonders they had seen here. But the public of the early 1800s just couldn't believe these wild tales about water that would shoot 150 feet into the air. However, the rumors about Yellowstone persisted. And in 1871, Congress sent an official expedition into the region to separate fact from fiction about this place. The expedition was under the leadership of Dr. F.V. Hayden, seated at the center of the table. Dr. Hayden brought with him noted artist Thomas Moran and photographer William Jackson. Their paintings and photographs, along with Dr. Hayden's official report, and the tireless campaigning of a citizen from Montana, Dr. Nathaniel Langford, finally persuaded Congress to set this land apart as the world's first national park. At first, men didn't know what to do with a national park. Poachers and meat hunters decimated the wildlife populations. In some parts of the park, illegal mining took place. Tourists defaced some of the natural features, and when illegal logging was closed down, large tracts of wilderness were set on fire. By 1886, the situation was so bad that the government sent the U.S. Army to regain control. Soldiers were stationed throughout the park. And so, the wilderness was preserved. A wilderness that remains today very much like it was when the mountain men first saw it. 
Today, even in May, there is a deep mantle of snow in the high country. But as the circling days grow longer, winter is losing its grip. As the sun arcs higher across the sky, its increasing intensity diminishes the winter snowpack, a process that happens drop by drop. The drops coalesce into thousands of rivulets and streams cascading down the mountain. On Yellowstone Lake, the ice breaks up slowly, grudgingly relinquishing its sedentary winter ways. Driven by the quickening tempo of the season, the swollen lake pushes its load into the Yellowstone River, creating a mini spectacle of its own. All across the Yellowstone region, placid streams become raging torrents. For thousands of years, the drama of birth has occurred with the first greening of the land and with the spring breakup. For young elk, born in late May and early June, swollen rivers are major obstacles. Some calves follow their mothers into the raging torrent. A few are swept downstream. In a month, the calves will be sturdy enough to swim the swiftest rivers. But for now, waiting seems to be the best choice. Cow and calf are reunited again in one of the thousands of little dramas that take place in Yellowstone on a daily basis. It is now June, but there are still large drifts of snow in Hayden Valley. This valley is the ancestral home of the grizzly. In spring, bears gather here to feed on roots and tubers. Occasionally killing even their own offspring, male grizzlies, called boars, are a threat to cubs. For the past two years, this mother has led her young to safety. But this time, sensing a change in their mother's behavior, the cubs retreat alone. For several years, they may roam together, but finally, they too will lead the solitary lives of mature grizzlies. The male and the female approach each other cautiously. Their solitary nature makes them hesitant, even when coming together for mating. The cubs watch from a safe distance. They have been weaned. They are on their own now. In the northern part of the park, along the Yellowstone River, spring is in full bloom. After wintering in this semi-arid region, pronghorns now have their young. When a wandering coyote passes nearby, the does view this encounter with a good deal of nervousness. They don't like the coyote anywhere in the vicinity of the new fawns. The coyote himself is a bit nervous. He's not nearly so fierce as his reputation, and the sharp hooves of the antelope could do him damage that would make hunting difficult, threatening his own survival. The two does seem determined to make an indelible impression on this one singular coyote that he cannot mistake or misunderstand.
Waterfowl and summer birds return to the ponds and marshes of Yellowstone. Sandhill cranes claim a nesting territory that they like. The yellow-headed blackbird also claims a nesting area near the edge of the marsh. His mate forages in the grass for insects, not nearly so colorful as the male, as is typical for birds. With astonishing skill, she literally snatches mosquitoes from the air. On a warm day in late spring, insects sometimes have to be measured in pounds. This may seem shocking to humans, but it is protein for the birds and a natural part of the cycle of life. In the northern part of the park, large stretches of grass and sagebrush spread across the mountains and valleys. Similar to the prairies, this habitat provides an excellent home for the badger and her new family. They see light for perhaps the first time, a strange new world for them, and they stay close to their mother at first. But growing bolder, they begin to explore on their own. All across Yellowstone, new animal young romp into life stages as spring continues. Designed more for function than grace, the moose, with its long, lanky legs, can easily move through a wet marsh or deep snows in winter. As the largest member of the deer family, the moose is strong enough to protect itself and its young against any wild predator, even the grizzly. Dawn is a magic time in Yellowstone, a time when the animals are most active. North of Mount Washburn, the lush meadows of Antelope Creek attract elk and grizzly bears. Here, predator and prey still play out their roles without interference from man. A bear is primarily a grazer, sometimes a scavenger. When the opportunity presents itself, a grizzly is also a predator. Often, our human sympathies are misplaced. Elk are a valuable food source for the grizzlies. They are the most numerous large mammals in the park. However, only about 200 grizzlies now live in Yellowstone, and their future is clearly in jeopardy. With over two million visitors a year, Yellowstone may sometimes seem like an urban throughway in the summer months.
contrast to the slower pace of Yellowstone, it is sometimes difficult for visitors to give up the frenzied pace of city time. Yet, Yellowstone has its own way of slowing folks down. People recall seeing as many as 30 roadside bears in the 50s and 60s. But there were problems. These begging bears often injured park visitors. Today, with strict enforcement of no feeding regulations, there are fewer injuries. The bear jam still exists, but now the bear observed by visitors is feeding on natural food rather than garbage. And more fun to watch if you can find it. Visitors come from around the world, and most want to see this magnificent bear. Yellowstone has over a thousand miles of trails for visitors to explore. In order to experience the slower pace of Yellowstone, the hiker has only to travel a few hundred yards from the road. Up on Specimen Ridge is one of the lesser known wonders of Yellowstone, the petrified forest. petrified forests of Yellowstone are slowly being revealed here on Specimen Ridge by the process of erosion. There isn't just one forest here. There are 27, one layered on top of the other. And this is the only place in the world where petrified trees remain standing in the upright position. 50 million years ago, dust and ash from titanic volcanic eruptions rained down on the living forest. When rain and water followed, minerals in the ash slowly replaced the wood fibers of the trees, turning them to stone. These fragments of petrified wood are protected by law today, because in the past, entire trees were sometimes removed by souvenir hunters. The growth rings are still clearly visible, so that the species of many trees can be identified. Even the splinters of fallen trees were sometimes turned to stone. The timelessness of this place will linger with Shannon as he continues his hike over the top of the mountain. The first destination for many visitors is Old Faithful, which lies surrounded by a huge visitor parking complex today. But Old Faithful is still living up to its name. And when it is about to erupt, the crowds begin to gather. It doesn't go off every hour on the hour, however. Time between eruptions may vary from 30 minutes to an hour and a half. An eruption of Old Faithful is never a disappointment. It may eject a column of water as much as 130 feet into the air. Mm -hmm. 
Old Faithful is not the only geyser in what is known as Upper Geyser Basin. Looking down the Firehole River from Old Faithful, there are many other geysers within walking distance of Old Faithful itself. In one square mile, there are nearly one-fifth of all the major geysers on Earth. Beehive Geyser is very near Old Faithful. It erupts with a roar that shakes the ground. More spectacular than Old Faithful, Beehive ejects a column of water 230 feet into the air. However, it only erupts about every 20 hours, so fewer people see it. Once a startling, brilliant blue, Morning Glory Pool has faded. Trash and debris thrown into the pool have changed the water flow, and it has lost some of its bright color. Boardwalks provide for the safety of the visitor, as well as that of the geysers. Yellowstone has about 10,000 thermal features. They are unstable. Occasionally, a geyser may even disappear, while a new geyser may spring to life in another unexpected location. As the eruption subsides, minerals may precipitate out of the runoff water, forming terraces around the geyser. And the cone of some geysers may be revealed as the water subsides into the subterranean chambers where it'll be reheated to erupt again. Old Faithful Inn has become an important landmark now. It was built in the single winter of 1904. Designed by a young architect of that period, it was intended to blend with Yellowstone's natural surrounding. Consequently, the building materials were gathered from the park. The stones for the fireplace came from only a mile away, something that wouldn't be permitted today. The lobby is seven stories high and may evoke the impression of a cathedral built of lodgepole pine. It is a grand hotel, 350 rooms. In order to stay here in the summer, reservations will have to be made months in advance. In contrast to Old Faithful Inn, Lake Hotel is a more elegant Yellowstone facility and is actually older than Old Faithful Inn. Construction of this hotel began in 1889. It was expanded in the 1920s to meet the demands of tourists and visitors of that day for graceful surroundings. Yellowstone Lake is the largest high-altitude lake in North America. On the margins of the lake, flowers also form part of those graceful surroundings. A bald eagle may look down on another species of bear here. The black bear is an excellent tree climber, though this one doesn't give much evidence of that at the moment.
black bears are not always black. They can range in color from cinnamon, a reddish color, to almost blonde. But they are often brown, such as this family of black bears. Like its cousin, the grizzly, the black bear spends much of the time grazing. Small animals such as mice provide most of its meat. And it relishes almost any insect as it tries to get enough fat to see it through winter hibernation. An assignment rangers particularly enjoy is observing wildlife. The trumpeter swan is one among many animals that owe their survival to the sanctuary provided by Yellowstone National Park. The rangers gather data which may contribute to solving a mystery surrounding these swans. Despite the park's protection, the trumpeter swan population has dwindled in the past 30 years. The reasons? are unclear. Nest flooding, parasites, and human disturbances are suspected causes. <laughs> Through research, management, and a concerned citizenry, it is hoped the trumpeter swan will not become just another faded memory of grace and beauty. Summer weather in the high country of Yellowstone has always been variable. A day that begins warm and sunny may dissolve into an afternoon shower or erupt into a storm. At this elevation, even snow is possible in June or September. At first, the winds begin to blow. Then a quiet stillness before the storm breaks. The meadows and forests of Yellowstone are fed by a constant supply of water from winter snow and summer showers. Lush vegetation supports the largest number and greatest variety of large mammals per square mile in North America. A summer storm may end as quickly as it began. It is now mid-July, as the sun rises again over Yellowstone. Two young men prepare breakfast at Yancey's Hole. 
Pole is a mountain man term, which means valley. And here in Yancey's Valley, breakfasts have been served to outdoorsmen and trail crews for a hundred years. There used to be a hotel here. The hotel has long since disappeared, but the breakfasts are still being served. Breakfasts that are available to the visitor today. If one wants to join these early morning breakfast cookouts, he'd be leaving Roosevelt Lodge about now. But these young fellows have been out since 4 a.m. and they're about ready for that first cup of coffee. The trip out from Roosevelt Lodge takes about an hour in a covered chuck wagon. By the time they arrive, breakfast will be ready, as expected. All sorts of good things to eat. Also, as expected. Many visitors wear coats or jackets. Because even though it is July, the temperature often dips into the 20s at night. And the crisp mornings create hearty appetites. In the lower 48 states, the Yellowstone is the last great undammed river. Enriched by Yellowstone Lake, its cold, clear, unpolluted waters supports a variety of creatures, such as pelicans. In June and early July, cutthroat trout spawn in the river. They may feed a variety of wildlife. As the Yellowstone River flows north, its placid character changes. It becomes rougher, more turbulent. Falls of the Yellowstone is twice as high as Niagara Falls. The river plunges into the spectacular Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. It is here that one can see the yellow color that gives both the river and the park their name. The wild, turbulent river has helped carve a 20 mile long canyon over the past 200,000 years. In the depths of the canyon, an osprey rides upwelling air currents and searches the river for fish. Located in the canyon, an osprey nest built of twigs and branches is safe from any predator. Female bighorn sheep raise their young on the precipitous slopes of the canyon. Though adapted to this rigorous environment, even a sure-footed sheep may occasionally plunge to its death. The bordering forests provide homes and food for a variety of songbirds. The black-capped chickadee, the striking western tanager, the acrobatic pine siskin, and the raucous Clark's Nutcracker. A Yellowstone treasure are the bubbling mud pots. Here, nature has mixed hot gases, mud, and water to create these active features. 
They display an astonishing variety of personalities and styles. As herd animals, elk have evolved a complex system of communication, including vocal and chemical cues, as well as body posturing. Although the significance of their behavior often remains a mystery to us, there are unmistakable expressions of dominance and submission. About an hour before sunset, calves emerge from their hiding places in the grass for games that may last an hour or more. Play develops coordination and agility and prepares the calf for the serious game of survival. In the northern part of the park, Mammoth Hot Spring is in a constant state of change. Underground, the springs at Mammoth percolate through layers of limestone. The hot water dissolves the limestone. When the water emerges at the surface, the limestone precipitates out and is deposited as travertine. The fastest growing spring can put down as much as 12 inches of limestone per year. It is an inexorable process that can cover whatever may be growing nearby. Two tons of limestone are removed from the heart of the mountain every day to create these exquisite fragile terraces one of the largest thermal features to be found anywhere. Smoke on the mountain in the summer of 88. In the beginning, against a blue sky, it was picturesque, rising 10,000 feet or more. The fires continued to grow. The numbers got bigger, 2,000. 4,000, 10,000 acres. The sky was no longer blue. Winds blew through the park at 80 miles per hour. Overnight, some fires doubled in size. By the end of August, the North Fork fire had burned 100,000 acres. It headed toward the town of West Yellowstone, an old faithful inn. 
No one living here had seen such fury. Through the summer, park employees experienced a full range of emotions, a fear at first. Then people became almost mesmerized, as if it were meant to be. Perhaps one must stretch his mind to include yet another aspect of being alive, being part of nature, being reminded that nature is more than something pretty, that wilderness speaks in many ways, on many levels. During the fires, there was concern about the wildlife. It soon became apparent, however, that for the most part, large animals moved calmly and safely near burning areas. Buffalo, elk, and other large animals were seen resting and grazing within sight of the flames, sometimes only a hundred yards from burning trees. Most seemed completely unconcerned about the fire. Then in September, the temperature dropped and it snowed. It was this act of nature that made the fires go out, rather than the efforts of the largest firefighting contingent in history. 10,000 firefighters, 45 helicopters, 100 bulldozers, the Army and the Marines. When viewed from the air, you can see a mosaic, a haphazard burn. The fire played hopscotch on the wind. You see burns, then green trees, scorched grasslands, untouched meadows, new meadows. This mosaic shows why the fire couldn't be put out. High winds carried embers a hundred yards, a half mile downwind, starting new fires. Crowning carried fire over hand lines, over roads and highways, over rivers and canyons. While many people saw the fires as a catastrophe, scientists immediately recognized that Yellowstone had been the site of a remarkable natural event. Now, they would have the opportunity to watch the process of growth from the beginning. Fire transforms the scene, opens up the forest, prepares the ground for new life, then new plants can grow. And the diversity of life increases. It becomes a healthier forest. The forest needs a fire or a windstorm to open up the canopy and let the sunlight in. One year after the burn, these meadows are ablaze with wild flowers and life in the wilderness of Yellowstone continues, much as it always has. The grizzly is a symbol of all that is most compelling in the very idea of wilderness. Yellowstone is a complex natural system largely free from the activities of man, a wilderness island in which the grizzly can find sanctuary. But grizzlies require huge areas of habitat. In its search for prime forage, a mature grizzly may range more than 100 square miles in a season. Its wanderings may take it beyond the boundaries of the park. Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding federal, state, and private lands are referred to as the Greater Yellowstone. The grizzly's survival depends upon the bear being allowed to roam the greater Yellowstone. Even though he is protected in this national park, his future is somewhat uncertain. The black bear seems to be holding his own in Yellowstone, though he no longer exists where he was once common. The story is different for buffalo. They have made a successful comeback from near extinction in 1900. Just 20 animals survived then. August is their breeding season. This leads to fighting among the bulls as they court the cows. 
Bulls test their prowess to determine the dominant males, those animals best fit for mating. Although they may appear slow and cumbersome, when approached too closely, they can be dangerous, even deadly. This could be called a chip off the old block. He seems to have taken on more than he can handle, but he certainly has the right spirit. August is also fly season in Yellowstone, and the buffalo have set up a rigorous exercise program in response to that particular problem. There are hundreds of waterfalls in Yellowstone. They are a manifestation of part of what makes Yellowstone unique, a constant, dependable supply of water throughout the summer months. Sometimes it may seem that they are voicing a paean to the elemental forces of nature, to the eternal cycles that make life on this planet possible. Cycles such as the rainfall itself, the ebb and flow of the seasons, or the change from dark to light each day. No matter how you may try to insulate yourself from these natural rhythms, you cannot entirely escape them. Your own heartbeat is one of them. On a tranquil morning in August, a mysterious sound pervades the forest. The cones are ripe, but they do not fall by themselves. They have a little help. The red squirrel is an enormous bundle of energy in a small package. In a couple of hours, he may harvest cones from 20 trees, cutting as many as 30 to 50 cones from each tree. The lodgepole pine forest lacks the complexity and diversity that characterizes much of Yellowstone. Yet this forest is an ideal habitat for the pine squirrel, because pine cones are his main source of food. Once the cones are harvested, they must be stored because they are his winter food supply. With any luck at all, he may remember where these caches are buried. With a growing chill and sense of anticipation in the air, summer blends into fall. Cottonwoods shed their leaves. And for a brief period, aspens are inflamed with gold. Thank you. 
At the ranger station, autumn is a time of preparation in Yellowstone. With summer vacations over, there are fewer visitors in the park. But for the rangers who remain in Yellowstone, there is much to be done before the gentle days of Indian summer give way to the winds of winter. It is a time to stock backcountry cabins with winter supplies. since I was uh, 12 or 13 years of age. I guess there's nothing I'd rather do. I find, you know, trips like this are much of what I envision myself doing, you know, and getting into this line of work. I don't get to spend enough time back here any longer. But I, for me, you know, much of what I got into the Park Service for in this line of work is offered, you know, in places like this, in the backcountry. You know, it's important and it's important not to ignore it and certainly enjoy being back here. The system of snowshoe cabins was originally established by the military so soldiers could patrol the park's interior in winter. The borders must still be patrolled during the autumn hunting season. You know, this is where the park is at. It's mostly in the back country. For large animals, autumn is a time of struggle, of battle. Now the bighorn rams engage each other in fights for dominance, clashes which are always spectacular and sometimes violent. Mid-fall, snow silently shrouds Yellowstone country. Wildlife responds with a montage of behaviors. Large bulls gather cows into harems, but their hold is tenuous. Cows do not always cooperate, and competing bulls lure straying females. Occasionally, when two bulls are of equal size, they may resort to physical combat to determine who will dominate during the season for breeding. Now, each bull tries to protect his own flanks while trying to gore the side of his opponent. Finally, one bull proves to be superior. For the coyote, it is a time of transition. Some of his summer food is still available. The gnawing hunger of winter is put off for a while. The coyote continues to hunt voles, mouse-like creatures which live in the grass. With an acute sense of hearing, the coyote can locate voles even under a foot of snow. Every attempt does not end in success, however, so he tries again. It takes more than one vole to feed a hungry coyote.
He'll hunt voles for about another month until the snows become too deep to reach them. Before denning in late autumn, the grizzly cubs have one last playful fight. When they emerge from the den next spring, they will go their separate ways, unable to tolerate each other any longer. By December, battles between the rams become more intense as the males seek the favor of ewes. Winter settles over Yellowstone with a bitterness that freezes all but the swiftest of rivers or those heated by thermal springs. Now, the snows have become so deep that the coyotes can no longer reach the voles beneath. They must turn their attention to other, larger prey. Now the coyotes will be dependent upon buffalo and elk to sustain them through the winter months. But the coyote doesn't kill the elk. He follows the herds and waits. He waits for the bitter cold to kill the old, the sick, and the injured. Ironically, the more severe the winter, the better the coyotes will fare. Herds of elk, led by seasoned cows, migrate from the high country to the milder valleys below. Unhindered by man, these herds follow routes that have been used for thousands of years. For five months, the frozen waters of Yellowstone Lake become a winter playground for river otters. Using their bodies as sleds, Otters can travel for miles in search of open water in which to fish. They're so proficient at capturing fish, they have plenty of time to just enjoy life. The ice now forms a bridge it allows a coyote the opportunity to steal an otter's catch. But first, the coyote will have to fight off competing coyotes. Now there's still the otter to contend with, who's perfectly capable of defending his own fish. Whether Yellowstone will succumb to economic and political decisions that diminish its wilderness character is yet to be determined.
winter's calm and fragile beauty is deceptive. For most of Yellowstone's wildlife, it is a season of waiting, of hanging on, until winter's hold is loosened by the thawing winds of spring. Yellowstone Park was the beginning of a great national experiment. An experiment that is continuing today as we try to preserve a small part of the original wilderness that once covered this entire continent. Thank you.